Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Scott Maxwell. I have the honor and the privilege to serve St. John Lutheran Church in Linthica, Maryland. Good to be with you today. As you know, it is Memorial Day weekend, a day off, although what's a day off these days? So many people working from home and days just run into one another. It is really kind of the official start to summer, right? I hope it can be for you. One thing that is happening is that we have a lot of graduations going on. And typically we might recognize our senior, high school seniors at a dinner or something like that. Uh, but this year it's a little different as in so many other things. I am grateful to Deacon Dan Granofsky and his granddaughters who made some trips out into the neighborhoods and with proper, proper social distancing, uh, we're able to deliver our traditional blanket uh, to our high school graduating seniors and, uh, and to bring the love of St. John to them in their homes since uh, we are, aren't together in in uh, in-person gatherings quite yet. So today, uh, before we get into our worship uh, service online, I, uh, I'd like to recognize our graduating seniors. They've made a wonderful accomplishment. And so a little different this year, we'll do it online and recognize them uh, because it is a, a special time and a major milestone for these young, young folks' lives. And so, without further ado, let's uh, introduce you and, uh, and celebrate with them as they are graduated from high school. We'd like to first recognize Alyssa Brumfield. Alyssa plans to attend Anne Arundel Community College and major in business administration. We next like to recognize Kelsey Davis. Kelsey plans to attend Salisbury University and major in exercise science and sports medicine. As a note, Kelsey is also the 2020 recipient of the Pippin Scholarship here at St. John. We now like to recognize Jackson Huber. During Jack's uh, senior year at North County, he actually began his college path to early childhood education by taking his first college course simultaneously with his regular high school schedule. Next, we would like to recognize Allison Newman. Recently learning to play the guitar, Allison is considering this for the future, but for now, we'll be taking classes to figure out what profession might be calling her. Bryce Rose, accepted into the Lincoln Technical Institute, Bryce will begin their HVAC program this summer. And last, but certainly not least, we have Marvin Hood who looks to be keeping his social distance at least six, well, maybe 60 feet from anyone else. But seriously, Marvin plans to attend Towson University this fall. He will be living on campus, but not quite sure what his major might be. Congratulations to all six of these graduates and all graduates around our community, country, and world as it is, again, a special milestone. May God bless you in whatever journey God calls you on. Enjoy it. Now, may we turn our hearts and our minds and be in the posture of worship, worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loves us, who gave his life for us, who continues to lead and guide us in the way of grace and mercy.
Hi everyone, my name is Beth Owens. It's great to be with you today. Many of you probably remember me as Beth Alexis. I grew up at St. John's. I was baptized, had my first communion and my confirmation there. And most of you probably know my parents, Carl and Jane Alexis. So hi, mom and dad. Currently, I live in Delaware with my husband, David, and our two kids, Hazel and Jack. And right now I'm actually a nursing student at our local hospital and I work at the hospital also as a nurse tech. So since coronavirus has started, I've actually gotten the opportunity to help take care of some of our patients with coronavirus there. But that's enough about me. Let's move on and hear from the word of God. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they, name, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, peace, and joy to you from God our Father and our Lord Christ Jesus. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to thee, my Redeemer and living Lord. Amen. Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to talk to you. It's so wonderful to just spend a moment back in, in our home, our church home. And I have a story to tell you that goes along with our text today, which is from John, the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 11. It's the prayer of Jesus for his disciples. But first, 20 years ago, my Army National Guard Engineer Unit went to a Partnership for Peace exercise in the beautiful but tiny Baltic country of Estonia. The exercise was an important part of Estonia's bid to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that you may remember as NATO. The Estonians had confirmed their independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, and the Russian Armed Forces finally left their country three years later. So I'm sure that you can understand that the people there really wanted to come under the protection of NATO very, very badly. Our little exercise consisting of U.S. soldiers, sailors, and Marines training with the Estonian soldiers became a matter of national pride, and the Estonians pulled out all the stops. The Estonians asked our commander, a Navy Commodore, to parade his troops through the 13th century university town of Tartu. We marched in uniform to the historical town square, and there was a crowd of politicians and military attaches from many different countries, including a Bulgarian military officer who, by the way, had a really cool fur hat, and a Russian military officer who had this big saucer cap. And I say this because I collect hats, so I really like their headgear. After some speeches, the troops were dismissed to go inside the lavish banquet hall for the grand reception. Privates and officers alike, Our hostesses offered them plates full of chocolate-covered strawberries and glasses of champagne. 
The walls were lined with tables of gourmet appetizers, including a five foot whole, five foot long whole sturgeon split down the middle and filled with caviar. Now, please understand that soldiers are not used to this kind of thing, and the astonished private stood in the middle of the room, not knowing what to do. I stood next to my first sergeant and said, this just might be a little bit above my pay grade. And he said, yes, it sure is. I agree. But do me a favor and try to get them soldiers to eat. <laughs> so after I persuaded the soldiers to overcome their bashfulness and dig in, my first sergeant came back and said he found something that I would really like. I followed him downstairs where there was a coat and hat rack next to the restrooms. On the hat rack was that furry brown bear hat that had been worn by the Bulgarian officer and a large gray saucer cap belonging to the Russian gentleman. My first sergeant devilishly asked, want to take a picture? <laughs> As he pulled a camera out of his pocket. I took the Russian officer's hat off the coat rack. I put it on my head. Goodness. <laughs> I came to attention, the first sergeant snapped the picture, I took the hat off, I put it back on the coat rack, my arms came back to my side, and the Russian officer came right around the corner from the staircase. <laughs> he kind of glared at me, he didn't see me with his hat on, but he kind of glared at me anyway, and I quickly followed the first sergeant up the stairs and out of there. When we got to the top of the stairs and before we went into the hall, I said to the first sergeant, hey, just give me a second. I got to say a quick prayer. And he said, far away. And I said, looked up to heaven and I said, Lord, please don't let me say anything stupid that might cause an international incident. My first sergeant laughed, but he knew I was for real. And that night at the staff meeting, he told all of the officers and NCOs and the non-commissioned officers and the Commodore made that prayer the official prayer of the exercise. And I, I heard it several times in the course of the next few weeks. The phrase above my pay grade means maybe this is meant for someone of greater authority or experience or rank than me. The gospel text from John today is set in the upper room. It is Thursday night. The supper has ended. The disciples' feet are washed and Judas has gone. Jesus stands before the disciple, looks heavenward, and prays. His public preaching work was finished. He would not again instruct the masses or heal the sick. There was nothing left to do but die. So he devotes himself to prayer. And what a beautiful prayer it is. There are many wonderful prayers in the Bible. The prayer of Solomon, the prayers of Abraham, Moses, the prayers of Paul, the Lord's Prayer. But this prayer is by far the greatest recorded in the Bible. Philip Melanchthon, Martin Luther's right hand man, said, There is no voice which has ever been heard either in heaven or in earth, none more exalted, more holy, more fruitful, more sublime than the prayer offered up by the Son to God himself. Jesus begins to pray. His disciples listen. What do you think they were thinking? <laughs> this is not a lesson or a sermon that they are used to hearing and asking questions about. Jesus is praying for himself and for them. He uses words like Father and your Son and glorify your Son. This is a prayer deep and rich with relationship and mystery. Jesus prays with a full and deep sense of the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. As he continues, Jesus' prayer seems to even define the role that two persons of the Holy Trinity have in our salvation. Now, I'll give you a spoiler alert here. Jesus speaks only of the Father and the Son in this prayer. We talked about the third person of the Trinity last week, and we'll talk about her again next week. Now, this is admittedly really deep stuff. But did the disciples get it? 
In all four Gospels, Jesus predicted his death and resurrection. In fact, it even appears this was well-known, common knowledge, because even the religious leaders asked Pontius Pilate to post a guard at his tomb. So they knew what was going to happen, but it seems that the disciples appear to be oblivious to it. In our Gospel lesson two weeks ago in John chapter 14, Jesus tells his disciples, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. He talks about preparing a place for them and says, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Yet Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And he has to remind Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now, back in the upper room, as they watch Jesus, God the Son, pray to Yahweh, God the Father. I have to wonder that perhaps at least one of the disciples had to be thinking, this has got to be a little bit above my pay grade. I am in over my head. Or at least the contemporary Aramaic version of the saying at the time, do you ever feel this way? I do. Sometimes I think the scriptures are a little over my head, slightly above my pay grade. I told pastor I felt like that when I first started studying this text again, even though I'd read it before. But Jesus explains it all in his prayer and in scripture. He is, after all, the word made flesh. Jesus begins his prayer, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all that you have given him. Previously in the Gospel of John, we have heard Jesus say that his time had not yet come. At the wedding in Cana, Mary asked him to do something about the wine, and Jesus tells her, my time has not yet come. When the religious leaders try to seize Jesus and stone him, they can't because his hour has not yet come. The hour Jesus speaks of here is his appointment with the work that will earn the forgiveness of sins for all people, for you, for me, for all believers. Jesus knows full well about the shame, suffering, and death that waits for him. He knows full well the wrath of God that he will endure as he takes our punishment for our sins on himself. The Gospel according to John uses the words glory or glorify about 40 times. When we hear the words glory and glorify outside the Bible in today's world, they usually refer to fame, honor, wealth, and so forth. And in truth, is that not what our culture puts value in? Do we not pray for the good life, for the high-paying job, the pretty face, the popularity, for more Facebook likes? <laughs> Martin Luther described Jesus' intercession for the disciples as a model and warrant for Christian prayer. It is our prime example on how to pray. Theologian Charles Spurgeon writes, Christ's motive should be ours. When asking a blessing from God, Ask it that you may glorify God by it. In other words, if you want God to bless you and show you some love, <laughs> be sure that you use that love in whatever form that it may be that you are asking to love others as he commanded us to help those we see in need, to stand up for those who are treated unfairly. And in this way, we glorify him. In the Bible, glory is lowly service. In the case of Jesus, his greatest glory comes as he hangs on the cross. With these words, Jesus, God the Son, prays for the strength to submit to death on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins to glorify God the Father. And this is where Jesus' divinity is made clear, and the role of the persons of the Trinity are defined in Jesus' prayer. God the Son glorifies God the Father by dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that we can be in right relationship with God. 
God the Father glorifies God the Son by raising him from the dead so that we may have eternal life. Jesus continues, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. As Lutherans, we believe in salvation by grace through faith. Our faith is a free gift from God. Though we don't deserve it, there is comfort in this prayer for those who are afraid that their faith is not strong enough, that they are not sure of their salvation. Throughout the prayer, Jesus speaks of the disciples as those whom the Father has given him. The disciples were not responsible for their faith. The disciples did not attach themselves to Jesus of their own will. Instead, God chose them, and Jesus prayed for them as a gift to him from God the Father. Likewise, God has chosen you. It is God who chooses those who receive Christ's gift of eternal life. Now I ask you, isn't it cool that Jesus considers us a gift from God our Father to him? Jesus continues to pray to the Father, I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Again, we get pretty deep here. Jesus did not wait until his death on the cross to glorify God. He glorified God his entire life. Every sermon preached, every blind or sick person healed, every bit of instruction and training to the disciples, every confrontation every confrontation with corrupt religious leaders, every question answered, every loving touch, they all glorified God. Jesus has one main petition. God the Son is asking God the Father to receive him back to the glory that he had given up to become man and accomplish our salvation. And now Jesus sums it up. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept their word, your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them, and now I am no longer in the world. But they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. With these words, Jesus prayed specifically for those whom the Father had chosen. He knew that they would endure incredible grief over the next few days. He, their teacher and their friend, would be arrested, hung on a cross, and buried in a tomb. He would not be with them to care for them as he had before. Jesus did not want them to be alone at this time. Jesus was also looking ahead to the time after his resurrection. Jesus knew he would soon ascend into heaven, and that is what we celebrate today. Jesus, the Word, made flesh, gave the disciples all the words given to him by the Father. Those words are the Holy Scriptures. And they would sustain them and us in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. After Jesus ascended, the disciples would continue to endure the attacks of this sinful world, as we do today. They needed protection. So do we. Jesus prayed for the Father to keep them unified, not just in any unity, but in the unity of God's name. Jesus prayed that in the name of God, they would have the transcendent unity of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And finally, Jesus prays for us. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us. Now here's the wrap-up. The Father and the Son are in such perfect unity that the Father gives his word to the Son, so that the Son may speak his word to them, and by his word bring them and us to the knowledge of God. And the Son speaks the Father's word to all whom the Father has given him, and they and us hear the word and receive it. And the Son gives those who were at one time estranged and dead in their sins back to the Father, alive and children of God. So what does Jesus' prayer for his disciples mean for you and me who believe through their word? Nothing less than eternal life. That you know God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. This is the prayer that our Savior prays for you. I encourage you to read the rest of Jesus' prayer, in John chapter 17, and to consider spending time in the Word with God each day, reading a little scripture, praying, and just spending a few moments with our wonderful God. With Pentecost coming next week, having heard our Savior's prayer, we anticipate with joy the coming of the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who reminds us of Jesus, who gives us the knowledge of the only true God, which is eternal life. Now I ask you, is all this good news still above our pay grade? Certainly not. Although our understanding of God's unity is imperfect in this life, we are unified in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When we leave this world, God will glorify us with him forever in heaven. There we will finally see and fully share in the glory of the Father, not as a reward, but as a promise. Eternal inheritance for all believers. Until that day, we pray that God would see us and use us to glorify his name in this world, in all that we do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, my name is Matthew Kane, and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, as a vocation, I am the Director of Food and Beverage Operations for Club Corp. I am stationed at Eagle's Nest Country Club in Phoenix, Maryland. Uh, and I have been here for uh, three years today. Um, I've been a part of St. John's Congregation my entire life, uh, so 36, almost 37 years. Uh, and as many of you know, and many of you don't, I was very involved in uh, music and worship uh, when I was younger. Uh, <clears throat> like many of you, uh, I've been fortunate enough to keep working during the quarantine, but uh, I certainly feel for and pray for those who have not been as fortunate. Um, my wife, Erin, and I live in Hillthorpe, Maryland, and we have two young children, Addison 11 and Jackson 6. Uh, and in our free time, uh, I like to play golf. And uh, I've recently realized that a lot of my favorite things are non-essential. Um, that's enough about me. Now let's turn to confess our corporate faith statement. Living together in trust and hope we confess our faith using the word of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, 
and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. May we now be in a posture of prayer. O oh God, call your people to be one as you are one. Unite your church in the truth of your gospel, the love of our neighbor, and the call to proclaim your reign to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Breathe life into your creation. Guide your people as we explore the mysteries of the universe. We pray for the work of scientists whose skill enriches our understanding. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your justice known among the nations of the earth. Protect the vulnerable, the sick, the dying. We now pause for a moment of silence as we bring the names of those who are close to us before you, O oh Lord. Redirect those who use violence and greed as weapons. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Come to the aid of your children. We pray for those engulfed in grief, those without supportive families, and for all who are isolated, powerless, or afraid, that all may rest their anxieties in your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage to all who embark on new ventures. We especially remember this day those who risk their lives to serve in our armed forces and on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic. Grant safety to those who are serving at home or abroad and assure them of your never failing strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Let us pray with confidence in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Matthew. Receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.